So the first thing to start out is the motivation that one should uh, bring about when uh, listening. One should uh, always check that motivation to make sure it is the right, it is the proper one. Then so when we talk about motivation or attitude, what does that actually mean? Attitude, motivation is simply that which we want, that which we strive for, that which we keep in mind constantly. And what is it that we should keep in mind? What is it that we should strive for? That which we should strive for is to establish all sentient beings in the state of omniscient Buddhahood. If we do everything, if we perform our every task, everything that we do uh, with that idea, with these thoughts in mind, with this motivation, then everything will indeed become a means to that end. If our every study of the Dharma, practice of the Dharma, our every uh, uh, dealings with the Dharma, if all of this is motivated by the idea, by the thought or the wish to bring about lasting benefits and welfare for the sake of all beings, including ourselves, if we practice, if we study accordingly, not only for our own benefits, but uh, uh, for the benefit of all beings, then this is indeed that which we call the motivation or the attitude of a practitioner of the greater vehicle or the so-called Mahayana. So everything then uh, uh, becomes characterized by this wish, by this motivation. If on the other hand, we strive only for our own personal benefit without taking the benefit and welfare of other beings into account, that would rather <sighs> characterize or categorize us as a practitioner of the so-called lesser vehicle or the Mahayana. In that way, it goes without saying that it is far more preferable that we should adopt the, uh, the first of these two motivations and act not only for our own benefit and welfare, but for that of all sentient beings. <laughs> We may ask ourselves now what is the difference between these two kinds of motivations? What makes the difference between acting uh, with the benefit and welfare of all beings at heart or in acting just for our own sex. The difference is lies in the fact that uh, everything that we do with this great motivation at heart, everything, every, every, every act that we perform with the motivation that it may be for the benefit and welfare of <laughs> beings, that all the good, all the positive, the, neg the, the merit that is being accumulated <laughs> through such a deed will not be uh, exhausted until we ourselves 
attain the great awakening of Buddhahood. This is being likened uh, uh, to a tree, a fruit tree that bears fruit, flowers, leaves and so forth year after year after year, which would correspond to the greater motivation of, uh, of um, working for the benefit of beings. And uh, the banana tree or water tree, as it is literally called in Tibetan, which bears fruit only one time, but dries up afterwards. <coughs> so if our motivation is, is, is uh, if we uh, make it accordingly, if we bring about your motivation to bring about benefit not only for ourselves, but for others, that benefit that is being uh, accumulated through this will last until we ourselves uh, gain the ultimate benefit uh, as well. <coughs> Then 他这个难呢,但是每天都几个送个,但是他这全部拆解一个,天啊,小孩。What Rinpoche intends to teach here over the next couple of days is called a explanation of Mahamudra, or an explanation for the practice of Mahamudra. Now speaking about explanations for the practice of Mahamudra, there are a great many different ones. They differ, uh, uh, in contents, they differ in length. There are some instru uh, some instructions, explanations on Mahamudra which are extremely elaborate. There are some which are of medium length. There are others which are uh, very concise. And the particular one which Rinpoche has uh, selected for this course, uh, it comes from or is contained within a collection of instructions by the omniscient Eighth Kamapa Mikyu Dorje, which is simply entitled the Short Instructions. This uh, collection of instructions by the 8th Kamapa Mikyu Dorje. It contains instructions uh, about the development of the enlightened attitude, about mind training, Lojong. It contains various uh, uh, other uh, instructions about Mahamudra as well. And Rinpoche has selected this particular one to teach here in this, uh, during this course. <laughs> Mikodorji himself, the Eighth Kamapa himself, has received all of these instructions from his own teachers. This particular one, which Rinpoche has uh, uh, selected to teach here during these days, uh, uh, was received by the Eighth Kamapa Mikodorji, by one of his main teachers, who was no one else but the first Sanjana Rinpoche, uh, whose name was Tashipaljo. And accordingly, the text itself, the instruction itself, is entitled uh, A Mahamudra, and herein is contained A Mahamudra instruction from the mouth of the Lord of Yogis, Sanjanyampa. Then so as the Eighth Kamapa Mikodorje starts out with the text, he begins by way of expressing his veneration for his own root teacher, for the, uh, the Mahasiddha of Denmark, as it is called here, another name for Sanjin Yempa. And uh, he says to the lotus feet of the Mahasiddha of Denmark, the uh, Lord of Yogis, Sanjin Yempa, I prostrate, I go for refuge, and I request his blessing and inspiration. So before starting out with uh, um, 
conferring these instructions upon us, uh, which he himself has received from his teacher, Sanjay Nyemba, he expresses the great respect, the great veneration he had for his root teacher by way of prostrating to him, by way of going for refuge to him, and by way of requesting the blessing and inspiration for himself and all sentient beings from Sanjay Nyemba himself. <laughs> In that uh, salutation, Mikadoja calls Sanjinyampa Denma Druptop, the Mahasiddha from Denma. This simply refers to the fact that the first Sanjay Nyempa Tashi Palja was born in a place, the name of which is Denkok or Denma, and he was thereafter referred to as the Mahasiddha, the great master from Denma. This is where the name Denma Druptop comes from. <laughs> Oh. <laughs> <laughs> so this is the meaning of one of the names of uh, Sanjay Nyempa or Denma Druptap as this is called. So we have learned that Denma or Denkok was the or is the name of the region in which uh, Sanjay Nyempa was born. Then there is that other name of uh, his Nyempa as uh, Mikudaja addresses him. Nyempa literally means something like boatman or ferryman. The point about this is that the actual village, one could say, the actual place itself where he was born, it was situated next to a great river. And there were many ferrymen, there was a lot of uh, uh, boatman activity going on, ferrying people across from one shore to the, of the river to the other. And this name has also uh, been uh, adopted for the, the, the village itself. So this is uh, another meaning of his name, Nyempa meaning uh, meaning boatsman or ferryman mm-hmm. Tanichungi so we may ask ourselves now, how does the term, the title Mahasiddha, great accomplished one, uh, get into Sanjay Nyempa or Denma Druptop's name, as he is called? Uh, that goes back to a story that happened during his lifetime, near the place where he was born, uh, in that region uh, of uh, Sanjay Nempa, there was a city or a, a, a large village with the name of Seok, and he stayed there for a while. He lived in a three-storied house, he lived on the top floor, and uh, one day it happened that uh, a great, a very bad earthquake took place. It was a really bad earthquake, it flattened the town completely, it killed many people, and uh, after a while, searching through the debris, people were wondering what happened to that person who lived on top of that three-storied house. They 
thought he must be dead, of course. So they searched for him, but instead of finding him dead, they found him a distance away, uh, sitting safely, soundly, completely unharmed, and uh, having, having survived that earthquake uh, without any damage, without any injury whatsoever. So everyone was very astonished, everyone was very surprised uh, by that. And since then he was given the name by the people of that area of Denmark, drop top of the Mahasiddha, the great accomplished one of uh, Denmark. So we are told to consider the existence in which we find ourselves now. We are told to consider the qualities, the freedoms and riches and so forth. We might wonder how we are uh, supposed to do that. We are familiar with uh, practices, with meditations, uh, during which we might, Im we might imagine ourselves in the form of a certain deity, for instance, of a white body color with uh, one face and two arms and so forth. We are familiar uh, with these meditations and visualizations as well. But uh, considering the preciousness of uh, the uh, human birth, of our human body, there is no such uh, uh, imagination to be done. It simply means that we have to carefully think about all of these qualities, that we have to carefully think about the circumstances which bring them about, and so forth. So when we then consider that precious human body that we have achieved, when we sit down and think about it, we might wonder what is so difficult about gaining a, a, a human birth. We are all here, we all have achieved a human body, and uh, that did not seem to be all too difficult at all to us. Now, when we are called upon to consider the precious human body that is so difficult to find and so easily lost, uh, it means that we should consider not only having gained a human rebirth as such, but on top of that also having made contact with the Dharma. We have come into touch with the teachings of the Buddha. We have met qualified teachers who are able to, uh, to explain these teaching to us, teachings to us. And this is what makes this uh, human birth that we have achieved so very precious, so very rare. These are the points which we are asked, which we are called upon to carefully consider. <laughs> So when we're being called upon to consider this precious human body which is so difficult to find, then it is exactly that circumstance uh, which, is, which is meant by that. The circumstance of our having made contact with the Dharma, having met qualified teachers and uh, uh, being in the uh, position, having, having, uh, having met with the possibility of learning and practicing the Dharma. This is what makes this human ex uh, existence that we have gained so uh, precious and so difficult to find. On the other hand, simply uh, to be born in a human body and uh, performing all kinds of negative deeds, going about our, our daily uh, activities uh, without any consideration, uh, um, uh, for the uh, the results that uh, may uh, that uh, that may come from them, that in itself is not so very special. Only the human birth that enables one to get in touch with the Dharma, to learn and practice it, and so forth. That is very rare indeed. <laughs> Ta 
now, having understood the significance of this precious birth that we have attained, having really understood and appreciated how rare an opportunity uh, this is, we will then be, uh, we will then also find it within, our, within ourselves to make the appropriate use of this uh, precious opportunity. We will not waste our times with all kinds of futile activities, but we will uh, strive to make our every activity, everything that we do, uh, into some kind of practice that will then finally enable us to uh, go beyond suffering and attain liberation and enlightenment. <laughs> Having considered the preciousness of this existence and having considered how rare it is to gain or to attain such an existence, we then also have to move on to the second consideration, which is that of impermanence. Even though we have now achieved such a precious human reverse, even though we have now the opportunity to study and practice the Dharma and so forth, we have no assurance whatsoever how long this life is going to last. Death will come unavoidably. There is no way around it and uh, we do not know when it comes. Therefore, uh, considering the, uh, the simple fact of this uh, precious and rare human body that we have received of this uh, being impermanent, not uh, going to be, not going to last forever, we have better make good use of it. If we then carefully consider this fact of impermanence, if we consider the fact that death will unavoidably come, then uh, we we are quickly we are quickly very clear about the fact that apart from the fact of death, there is nothing much else that is uh, certain within our lives. And concerning death itself. The problem with death is we do not know when it comes. Death might come this month, it might come next month, it might come in a couple of years. No one can say when he or she is going to die. When the moment of death, of approaching death has come and uh, it, is, it is time for us to die, uh, there is no means at all to avoid it. There is no medicine that we can take, there is no protection from it, there is no means of averting death whatsoever. Therefore, we should, we should carefully consider the fact that this is indeed so. No one knows when death will come. The one thing that we know for sure is that it will come. Considering that death, which will invariably and unavoidably come, 
There is but one thing for certain, which is that we will die of it. Having died, finally, then, according to the custom of our country, our bodies in which we have been born will be taken care of. Some places it might be burned, and other places it may be buried. Uh, whatsoever, there are many different traditions. And when we have finally died, when the bodies in which we have been born have disintegrated, there is not a single thing, not even uh, a grain or anything <coughs> of our possession that uh, we are able to take with us. We are absolutely powerless. We have absolutely no power at all to take anything of the possessions that we have accumulated, no matter what it might be, with us. Similarly, however many friends, relatives, uh, servants, uh, and whatnot we might have, uh, we might have uh, um, around us, we might have taken care of us, uh, we cannot take a single one of them along with us. Which means when we die, <laughs> which means when we die, we have to go absolutely alone. It's only us who dies, and uh, we are completely alone in that. So the one thing that we're able to take with us is our... <laughs> the one thing that we can take with us are our imprints, are the habitual tendencies of that which we have done in our lives, both positive or negative ones. Rubich is joking, saying like, like uh, these two, they make it out among themselves. <laughs> they seem to know everything about it. Rubich said to God, they make it out among themselves. They seem to know everything about it. Rubich said to God, they make it out among ま、門部社員な。誰に飲みに来な。誰に無班で呼ば。飲みに来グーグンと。さあ、高い用で。何、いなやん。誰に従前の巻き、レカの道具で飛んで、レカ用だわ。手に言うと、誰に霊が名物
ตั้งตัวที่ฉันรู้ไปเลยสอนเนี่ยยิ่งอย่างหลังจากนี้ยิ่งไม่ว่าคนไม่ว่าอย่างนั้นไม่ว่าแต่ไม่ว่าอย่
เออคนเลยยองจริงเนี่ยสมบัติเกิดเกิดขัดจิเสียบารันตองนะสะตาตาเทนดาวเกิดตันเนี่ยเนี่ยกับตองนั่งตัวตรงนี้เลยเกิด
Therefore, it is of extreme importance for those who concern themselves with Dharma, particularly for those who have resolved to practice the Dharma, to always and constantly remind themselves of how rare and precious an opportunity we have achieved, how easily it is lost, how things are extremely impermanent and how it is very unlikely to achieve such a precious opportunity again. Always, constantly, again and again, remind yourselves of that fact. Now this concludes our first session of Dharma instructions and uh, with this first session there should not be all too many questions. Therefore, uh, we should now dedicate the merit that has been accumulated for teaching and listening to such Dharma instructions for the lasting benefit and welfare of all beings.